darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. The firmament. And divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning with the second day. <laughs> and God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Those words of Genesis were scratched on tablets and parchment many, many years ago, after a man crawled out of his caves and began the ages-long process of exploring his universe and himself. Today, a great new chapter has been added to the story of creation and of growth. Man literally has wrenched himself away from the earth that bound him down through the millennia. He has soared to the moon, he has seen and shown it close. He has come back safe. That is the meaning of the mission of Apollo 8, humankind's first flight into the orbit of the moon, an event sure to be written larger on the books of history than almost any our generation has seen. A year of trouble and turbulence, anger and assassination, is now coming to an end in incandescent triumph. Apollo 8 achieved every one of its major mission aims and something else. It lifted the spirits of earthbound mortals and carried them too, if only for a while, out of their own horizons. Let there be light in the firmament of the heaven, said Genesis. Today there is a new light, and in the next hour we will look at its reflection. This is a broadcast about the flight of Apollo 8. This is a CBS News special report, Man at the Moon. The Flight of Apollo 8, brought to you by Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell System, as part of their continuing coverage of important news events. There's one traffic network in this country where there are almost never any traffic jams. The Bell Telephone Network, with equipment made and supplied by Western Electric. Oh, the Bell System Network has traffic problems, too. Like over 300 million phone calls a day. But there are millions of routes to choose from, and they're switching equipment to get you through. I'm glad I got through so fast. I'll never make that plane. You wouldn't believe this traffic. Bumper to bumper. Western Electric. We make bell telephones. We also make equipment for the network that keeps your phone calls from getting stuck in traffic. Western Electric. Manufacturing and supply unit of the bell system. America's greatest space triumph and one of man's most remarkable achievements to date is the result of work by thousands of people and outlays of billions of dollars. We've seen, heard, and talked a great deal about the sophisticated hardware that lifted the astronauts away from the Earth, guided them so accurately to and from the moon, and kept us in touch and informed about their progress. But the three men, Borman, Lovell, and Anders, were the heart and soul of the mission, although their very human personalities tended to be submerged beneath their cool, smoothly functioning technical skill. But they carried with them man's many hopes and dreams about someday leaving his planet and in interviews with David Schumacher in Houston, prior to the flight, they revealed how they felt. It's like to be on the first team. 
And uh, I think that friendly competition uh, uh, among groups, among nations, among people is always healthy. Uh, I think the competition which we have uh, in space between the Soviet Union and ourselves is very healthy. Uh, and uh, of course, I'd like to be the first around. To me, uh, not saying the, uh, the complete truth, I didn't feel that I hope that uh, our flight uh, or, a, or a flight of Americans will be uh, the first to see the, uh, the backside of the moon. I don't believe that the, uh, the program as a whole would have survived as well after the fire if we wouldn't have had this momentum and this desire to complete this goal. That was a good idea. Uh, you know, we've been uh, planning this flight for years and years, and sometimes uh, when you read about it and hear it for so long, uh, you think that the goal is uh, academic, you know. You don't really finally understand that you're really going to try something like this, and now it's getting closer, and uh, we're not just talking about something in the future. We're talking about something right now. The goal to me is just as important as it was back in 1961. I think that uh, what risks there are have been well considered and designed for to uh, attempt to alleviate these risks. And I think that the gain that we will get to our Apollo program and uh, the gain that uh, our country and the, all the nations of the world will receive from uh, this first step of exploration will certainly make any risk I might take uh, more than worth it. We've taken a rather conservative approach to this first lunar mission. Uh, it's one that makes sense. We're doing it uh, where we, we only have to bother or concern ourselves with one vehicle. We don't have to train for a rendezvous or a lunar landing. And uh, really, uh, you know, this is the program we've been working on for almost 10 years now, so there's a lot of good hard engineering in it. I, I don't really uh, think we've left anything unturned. I hope we haven't. Of course, you'll never know until we finally do it. So these three quiet men prepared for what Commander Frank Borman later was to call a fantastic voyage. As head of the three-man Apollo crew, Borman already was a veteran of the space program. He became an astronaut six years ago after a career in aviation which followed his graduation in 1950 from West Point. Now an Air Force colonel, the 40-year-old Borman is married and has two teenage sons. James Lovell, the pilot of the Apollo Command module, is also 40 and flew with Borman on the two-week flight of Gemini 7. Lovell, a Navy captain and graduate of Annapolis, actually replaced astronaut Mike Collins on Apollo 8 after Collins ran into medical problems from a bone spur on the neck. Lovell is married and has four children. The youngest Apollo 8 crew member, Lunar Module Pilot William Anders, 35, was a space rookie until this flight. He's a major in the Air Force and also a graduate of Annapolis. In addition, he has a master's degree in nuclear engineering. Anders, too, is married and has five children. So these three men, joined in a spectacular adventure. Last Saturday morning, took their final walk across the Earth before leaving it for more than six days. With Borman in the lead, the three astronauts suited up and carrying portable air conditioners, headed for the van which would take them to the launch site for the elevator ride to the top of the 36-story tall Saturn V moon rocket. Here's how it went as we reported it, starting with the voice of Jack King at Mission Control. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are armed. Four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit. We have, we have lift off. Lift off at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Looks good. We have cleared the tower. Oh, and there's the rumble in our building. It looks good. It looks like a good flight. It's a beautiful takeoff so far. The building is shaking under us. Our camera platform is shaking. But what a beautiful flight. Man, perhaps on the way to the moon. If all continues to go well. You can. Craft. 25 the more seconds. The other four engines of the first stage should cut out. Two minutes, 20. Rocket then will be 20 miles high and going 3,000 miles an hour. See, we see staging. Uh, an S1C, the first stage cut off. Firm. All engines, all sources show the second stage is burning perfectly. 
half hours after that perfect liftoff came the historic decision, go for the moon. And this is how it sounded. Apollo 8, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. Apollo 8, you are go for TLI, over. Roger, understand, we're go for TLI. Go for TLI, translunar injection meaning to fire up the third stage engine to drive the astronauts up to a speed of more than 24,000 miles per hour, break them free of Earth orbit, and send them off to where no man had ever gone, toward the moon. During that early part of the voyage, the Apollo 8 crew went through a rehearsal of part of the maneuvers to be carried out on the way to the first lunar landing attempt. At the front of the third stage, just behind the spacecraft, is a compartment for carrying the lunar excursion module, the bug-like vehicle that actually is to put U.S. astronauts on the moon's surface next year. When the third stage separates, its forward panels are to break open, exposing the LEM, as it's called. Those future astronauts in their spacecraft ahead of the third stage then will turn their capsule around. They'll maneuver back, hook onto the LEM, and pull it free. There was no LEM aboard this trip, but on the lunar landing flight, there will be, flying in tandem toward the moon. But this time, what eventually will act as the mothership, the spacecraft, flew on alone, aiming only to achieve lunar orbit. Does this look like a washing machine? Or a toaster? Or a steam iron? Or a refrigerator? Hardly. But some people are still confused about what we make. Western Electric is the manufacturing and supply unit in the Bell system. We're a part of it. What we do make is telephones. And much of what it takes to connect them together, like underground cable. And to send your calls leaping through the air, microwave radio relay systems. And complex equipment that finds the number you dial. Western Electric makes this for your Bell telephone company and the other Bell telephone companies across the land. Because we're with them in the Bell system to help bring you dependable, low-cost communication service. Does this look like a refrigerator? On Sunday, one day along on their half a million mile round trip, the astronauts became sick. Borman apparently was hit by a 24-hour flu, while Lovell and Anders just weren't feeling well. But their illnesses quickly cleared up, in time for them to send back the first of the long-awaited live television problems with the small camera's telephoto lens frustratingly resulted in man seeing his first long-range view of the Earth as a big white blob, although the interior shots of the spacecraft were just fine. Okay, we're rolling around to a uh, good view of the Earth, and... Uh as soon as we get to the uh, good view of the Earth, we'll stop and let you look out the window at the scene we see. Jim Lovell's down in the lower equipment bay preparing uh, lunch. And, and uh, and Bill is uh, holding a camera here for us both. Hey, we have a picture. Uh, Can you see it now? Okay, it's a little difficult to see what we have. That's the Earth. But it's not the telephoto lens, unfortunately. It's just a regular inside lens. This transmission is coming to you approximately halfway between the moon and the Earth. And we've been uh, 31 hours, about 20 minutes into the flight. We have about uh, less than 40 hours left to go to the moon. As you can see, Bill's got his toothbrush here. He's been brushing his teeth regularly to demonstrate how things float around zero G. Like he plays for the Astros the way he tries to catch that thing. I certainly wish we could uh, show you the Earth. It's a beautiful, beautiful view with uh, predominantly blue background and uh, just huge covers of uh, white clouds, uh, particularly one very strong vortex up near the Terminator. Very, very beautiful. Happy birthday, mother. 
Ground Control told the astronauts how to fix the camera before the second telecast, which came Monday from more than 200,000 miles out. Hope that everyone enjoy the picture that we're taking of themselves. How far away from Earth now, Jim, about? We have you about 180,000. Looking at yourself. And you're all well, looking at yourselves as seen from 180,000 miles out in space. Mike, what I uh, keep imagining is if I'm a some lonely traveler from another planet, what I think about the Earth from this altitude, whether I think it'd be inhabited or not. You don't see anybody waiting, is that what you're saying? Well, I'm just kind of curious uh, whether I would land on the blue or the brown part of the Earth. You better hope we land in the blue part. So are we, babe. Jim is always for land landings. To give you some idea, Mike, what we can uh, see, we can, uh, I can pick out the uh, southwest coastline of the Gulf and where Houston uh, should be, and also the mouth of the Mississippi. I can see Baja, California, and that particular area. I'm using a binocular, which we have aboard. All right, well, we're seeing uh, the entire uh, Earth now, including the, the Terminator. Of course, we can't see anything uh, past the Terminator at all. Are you able, with your binoculars, to see uh, the, the dark horizon or anything past the Terminator? Uh, negative, uh, Mike. We can't see anything past the Terminator with the binoculars or without them. The flight continued on near-perfect course, the spacecraft now in the dominant pull of the moon's gravity being dragged along faster and faster. The first men in history to reach the moon now were preparing to go around it, losing all contact with Earth while they traveled across the backside where they would perform the critical braking maneuver needed to achieve orbit. It was an agonizing wait for those back on Earth. This animation shows how the 20,000 pound thrust spacecraft engine was fired to slow the capsule and prevent it from whipping around the moon and heading back toward Earth. The initial blast was to put the Apollo 8 into an elliptical orbit to be corrected later to a near circular path 69 miles above the lunar surface. But on the ground, no one yet knew if that braking maneuver had worked or even taken place. And then, as Apollo 8 came around the moon, voice contact again was established. We've got it. Apollo uh, 8 now in, in lunar orbit. Uh, there's a chair in the, this room. Uh, this is Apollo Control Houston, uh, switching now to the voice of Jim Lovell. success of achieving lunar orbit came Apollo 8's first live television pictures of the moon's forbidding surface.
Uh, Apollo 8, this is Houston. Uh, it's a good picture of the horizon. Uh, we can't see many terrain features as yet. There's a uh, very new uh, bright impact crater. Should be in the field of view now. Uh, Roger Bell. Do you see it in the upper part of your screen? Hey, Bill, how would you describe the color of the moon from here? Uh, the color of the moon looks uh, a very whitish gray like uh, dirty beach sand and uh, with lots of footprints in it. Don't these two craters look like uh, pickaxes, striking uh, concrete, maybe a lot of fine haze dust? Jerry, as a matter of interest, there's a lot of uh, what appears to be very small new craters that have these uh, little white rays radiated from them. Roger, Jim. Uh, looks like we just got... Roger, set. we're passing over the uh, crater Borman. And there's Anders out there. Level's right south of it. Roger. Jerry, another interesting feature, these small impact craters have dark spots in the center where it appears that the buried head and, and uh, hit some new material down below that's got a lot of fine white dust around them. Uh, Roger, I understand, Jim. Uh, this is uh, Houston, uh, Apollo 8, this is Houston. Looks like we can see Collins now. Roger, there's Collins for you. And Collins is right on the edge of Spice C, which we're about to pass over. Roger. Uh, Houston, this is Apollo 8. We're going to terminate our program for this pass and get on with preparations for LOI 2, if you say we're go. That LOI-2 maneuver just referred to was executed perfectly, putting Apollo 8 into the proper 69-mile-high circular orbit. Later that night, there was another telecast in which the astronauts described their thoughts on what lay below them. It is a uh, different thing to each one of us. I think that each one, of, uh, each one uh, carries his own impressions of what, of what he's seen today. I know my own impression is that it's a, a vast, lonely forbidding type existence or expanse of nothing. It looks rather like clouds and clouds of pumice stone. And it certainly would not appear to be a very inviting place to, to live or work. Jim, what have you uh, thought most about? Well, Frank, my thoughts were very similar. The vast loneliness up here on the moon is uh, awe-inspiring and it makes you realize just what you have back there on Earth. The Earth from here is a grand oasis in the big vastness of space. Bill, yeah, what do you think? I think the thing that impressed me the most were the lunar sunrises and sunsets. These in particular bring out the uh, stark nature of the terrain, and uh, the long shadows really bring out the relief. Uh, that is here and, uh, and hard to see in this very bright uh, surface that we're going over right now. The flight of Apollo 8 was a spectacular success even before the crew began their risky flight back to Earth. Soviet space scientist Leonid Satov said as the homeward journey began, this event goes beyond the limits of a national achievement and marks a stage in the development of the culture of Earthmen. But the flight also was a great national achievement, and this was noted by three of the Western world's leading scientists. Our correspondents interviewed Britain's Sir Bernard Lovell, U.S. Nobel laureate Harold Urey, and American astrogeologist Eugene Shoemaker. First, Lovell. In purely scientific terms, uh, for astronomy, uh, for example, uh, how do you view uh, Apollo 8? Is this... Uh, is there a lot of new information for you uh, yes. come out of this? I doubt if there will be a tremendous amount new as far as the astronomers are concerned from Apollo 8, but of course it was never intended to be a purely scientific enterprise. For science, the significance of the flight is that it is an, an immensely important stepping stone to the whole Apollo program, which we hope will now end up by getting the American on the moon in 1969. And then the astronomers like myself will be very, very interested indeed in 
of the material which is returned home. What about the uh, the photographs? Uh, they should have, uh, for example, yes. still pictures yes. back. From this. Yes, I, I imagine that when we see those photographs, they, they really will be quite splendid and marvelous. But of course, so have the photographs sent back by the lunar orbiters uh, and the surveyors. They have also uh, given many revelations about the nature of the moon. Therefore, I don't think we ought to expect too much from the purely scientific point of view from Apollo 8. Is this really a, a springboard then? Yes, I think it is. It's an, a springboard and uh, an amazing demonstration of American competence and virility. I, I, many tributes have been paid to the engineering excellence, but what amazes me also is the, what I think you call the, the logistics, the organization and management of this vast project. After all, it's only uh, less than eight years since uh, President Kennedy started off the program, and the accomplishment in that time, in spite of the setbacks, is really stupendous. We must remember that, that it is not primarily a scientific business at all. It is done uh, uh, as the pyramids were built, or as the Parthenon was built, something we can do that's magnificent and wonderful. Man is made that way. Whenever there's a challenge of this kind, someone somewhere will pick it up. We will go to the South Pole or the North Pole or climb Mount Everest or do things of this sort. Why does man pick up a challenge like this, Doctor? I don't know. He's made that way. He's done it all through history. And now we've come to a point in which we can go to the moon. And somewhere, someone is going to go to the moon. And I would be very sorry indeed if my country, the richest and the most powerful country in the world, didn't try to do it. And didn't try to do it first, as a matter of fact. I think there's a much stronger purpose, a national purpose, in going into space. And that has to do with the fact that Space is there now within our grasp. It's, it's now within the possibility to be explored. We have the technique to do it, but it requires a great deal of effort. It's a very difficult thing to do. And I think by this nation reaching out, by striving to do this, and by being bold enough to go ahead and explore, not just the moon, but beyond the moon, later on, other terrestrial planets, We'll be engaging in an activity that leads us on as a nation. It gives us forward momentum to do this. If one looks back through history, you will find that most nations or societies that have, that have come to prominence in history have been ones that were actively reaching out in one way or another, exploring in one way or another. I think it's an index of the, of the spirit of the people at that time, as well as of their technical ability. I think it's very, very important for the national spirit that we do this. And science and the technological uh, byproducts that come out of this are just that, they're byproducts, but they're not the real reason for going into space. We pause now for station identification. All right, you made a telephone. Congratulations. But uh, what are you going to do with it? Well, how? Yes, I know it works, but whom are you going to talk to? Okay, that's fine for the people next door, but how about the other people on the block? On the other streets in the neighborhood. How about the rest of the town? The other towns nearby? The rest of the state? The whole country? 
Western Electric can sympathize with you. We make phones, too. We make them for the Bell Telephone Companies. We also make complex equipment that connects one phone to another, so that when your Bell Telephone Company installs a Western Electric phone, you only need one pair of wires. Thanks for helping us make the point, Charlie, that Western Electric is in the Bell system to help people communicate. Oh, would you hold the phone out a bit? Now everyone can see. Much of the final period in lunar orbit was spent taking more film and still photographs. From these, scientists will learn more than they've ever known about the Earth's nearest neighbor in the universe and pick the spot where the first U.S. astronauts are to land. On Christmas Day, the Apollo crew, after circling the moon 10 times in just 20 hours, was ready to head for home. But as before, the critical maneuver had to be performed while the spacecraft was behind the moon. We will see what happened in animation while hearing the actual transmission at the time from Mission Control. And uh, here in Mission Control Center, we've just counted down to the burn. We should have uh, ignition at this time. That will be a three minute burn nominally. Uh, it will increase the spacecraft velocity by about 3,522 feet per second or some 2,395 miles per hour. Following the maneuver, the spacecraft should have a uh, velocity of about uh, 8,800 feet per second, uh, some 6,000 miles per hour. But no one on the ground could know if the spacecraft were going that fast until it re-emerged from behind the moon a few minutes later. A few minutes later it did, one of the most dramatic moments of the trip. Later came a Christmas Day telecast. What we thought we'd do today was just show you a little bit about life inside Apollo 8. We've shown you the scenes of the moon, the scenes of the Earth, and uh, we thought we'd invite you into our, our home. It's been our home at least for uh, four days. You can see on the, de the uh, instrument panel, we, uh, we mark off each day on the... Uh, on the instrument panel, we pour down and we're working on the fifth day. Of course, we're all looking forward to the uh, landing on Friday. And down here in the part of the spacecraft that we call the lower equipment bay, we have the president's advisor on physical fitness, Captain Jim Lovell, about to uh, undergo an exercise program that we, uh, we do every day. You notice that uh, he floats around very freely. Just bumped his head on the optics of our navigating. He's working with an exercise device that's designed to keep the muscles in shape. What do you have today, Bill, for uh, dinner? Well, here we have some cocoa. Which will be good. I'll be adding about five ounces of hot water to that. These are little uh, sugar cookies. Some orange juice. Corn chowder. Or 
the Earth. And this is where we find out exactly where we are in space, what direction, how fast we're traveling. And our computer, as uh, Frank had mentioned, then takes the information and tells us how to maneuver to get home safely. I work with the scanning telescope and the sextant, and occasionally if I get too busy, I just sort of float out of, out of sight and go up into the tunnel, which is the tunnel to the hatch of the lunar module, which we don't have aboard, of course. Well, that's about all we have for today. I, uh, each and every one of us would each, wish each and every one of you a very Merry Christmas. The next day, more than halfway home, the astronauts transmitted their sixth and last telecast from space. We hear first from Mission Control. This view from Earth uh, with a telephoto lens at uh, some 97,000 nautical miles. Down uh, on the Earth there, so far out in space, I uh, think I must have the feeling that the travelers in the old sailing ships used to have. You're going on a very long voyage away from home, and uh, now we're headed back. And uh, I have that feeling of being proud of the trip, but still uh, still happy to be going back home and back to our home port. And that's, uh, that's what you're seeing right here. Uh, Roger, Bill. We should be glad to get you back, too. This is Frank Borman. We, uh, we've enjoyed the uh, television shows, and I uh, invite you to stay... Uh, tuned in in the future because there'll be flights in the rendezvous in the Earth orbit and then of course there'll be televisions from the lunar surface itself in the not too far distant future. So until land, I guess this is the Apollo 8 crew signing off and uh, we'll see you back on that good Earth very soon. Roger, Frank. Adios. This morning, the perfect flight of the remarkable Apollo 8 ended in the pre-dawn darkness of the mid-Pacific, southwest of Hawaii. On target, on schedule. But before starting its long descent to splashdown, the cone-shaped command module carrying the astronauts had to separate from its service module and successfully penetrate one more barrier, the Earth's own atmosphere. The voice of mission control begins the last chapter of the flight story. The flight director has confirmed separation separation of the command module and the service module. We've been looking at data on the command module alone and all the values look quite good. The total blackout we're predicting this morning is on the order of three minutes. But since we have very little experience re-entering at these velocities, we uh, must caution you that those are only estimates. And we have lost signal. The, uh, our network controller says we lost signal at 1.46, 46 minutes, and uh, with very nearly 46 seconds. And our estimate is that this uh, blacked out period will, will continue, or let's see, three minutes. It's now uh, just two minutes past the time when we should have heard from the spacecraft through the blackout. Ken Mattingly puts in a, another call. And there's Jim Lovell. Ha-ha! He says we're looking good. I can't tell whether it's Borman or Lovell. Let's try to cut it in. We're in real good shape here. Real fine. 146 hours, 58 minutes, recovery two within the last minute. As reported, they have a flashing light in sight, and they followed that with, we have voice contact with the crew. Yes, uh, we saw the spacecraft coming down off the uh, port, uh, port side of the, uh, of the aircraft carrier, uh, a bright light in the sky, slowly descending toward the surface of the Pacific. It's now 5,000 yards from the Yorktown, and at just about this moment, it should be landing on the surface of the water. 
The astronauts waited patiently for more than an hour in their bobbing space capsule for dawn and the swimmers from the rescue helicopter hovering overhead. When dawn came, the astronauts climbed into a life raft and were hoisted aboard 80 minutes after splashdown. Astronaut Foreman and Lovell and Anders standing on the steps and a great cheer goes up from the sailors out here on the flight deck. All of them looking in very good condition, needing a shave, of course, shaking hands with Ben James. There's Captain Lowell shaking hands with Ben James. Walking slowly down the red carpet, accompanied by John Stone Cipher and Ben James. Colonel Borman, would you care to say a few words to the crew? Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, we're just very happy to be here, and we appreciate all your efforts, and I know you had to stay out here over Christmas, and that made it tough. I'm... Uh, Jim and I always seem to fly in December. We made it home before Christmas in 65, but we, we can't tell you much how, as, how much we really appreciate you being here and how proud it is for us to participate in this event because thousands of people made this possible, and I guess we're all just part of the group. Thank you very much. Then there was the traditional giving of ship's caps to the three astronauts who, when everybody stopped to think about it, were the first visitors from space they'd ever had. The astronauts then were taken to the ship's sick bay for medical exams while the Navy began the task of recovering the precious Apollo 8 space capsule. Before the astronauts arrived on the carrier, President Johnson placed a call to talk to them from Washington. They later listened to a tape recording of the President's words. You've taken us, taken all of us, all over the world into a new era. And my thoughts this morning went back to more than 10 years ago in the Pernalis Valley when we saw Sputnik uh, uh, racing through the skies and we realized that America had a big job ahead of it. It gave me so much pleasure to know that you men uh, have done a large part of that job. So uh, we rejoice that you are well and we send you congratulations from all of your fellow countrymen and from... Uh, all uh, peace-loving people in the world. The president spoke of the Russian launching of the original Sputnik more than 11 years ago, a fact which jolted many Americans into thinking seriously about space for the first time. CBS News did a broadcast on the subject that winter, and I was the correspondent. Let's go back in time now and look at our evaluation of the then brand new space race. Just three months ago, last October 4th, a new moon no bigger than the span of a man's arm came over the horizon and cast a different light on our affairs. Sputnik was a serious threat, if not to our immediate security, then to our sense of security. It shook the confidence of our allies, the respect of the neutrals. Moscow's mood has been one of new confidence, exultation in the Soviet press. Ours, a Soviet Sputnik, is first in the world. Entire world ecstatic over great victory of Soviet science. First step into the cosmos, Sputnik over all continents. In the race for control of the moon's surface, here's where we stand. Here's our first space vehicle, still on the ground. It might have been launched more than a year ago, a year ahead of the Russians. Originally, there was a joint Army-Navy project to put a satellite into orbit in 1956 using military rocketry. But the White House deliberately canceled that in favor of the lower priority scientific program. Right now, there is no problem in the theory or technique of orbiting a satellite that we haven't licked. But it's a laboratory licking. We need tests and more tests. In every quantity of tests, there's a definite number of failures. The Russians keep their failures to themselves. We don't. To sum up, in satellites, we are a year behind the Russians, the year we lost in the switch from the military to the scientific program. We hope to make up some time by using satellites with better instruments than theirs contain and thereby collect more information with ours. But the Russians are gathering valuable data right now. Since those dark days of 1958, the United States, too, has been gathering valuable data in flight after flight, suborbital, orbital, spacewalks, rendezvous, and now the trip to the moon. And so far as can be foretold, the United States is likely to put a man on the moon before its Soviet space competitor. 
At the very hour of splashdown, we sent cameras to look at the bizarre craft which is slated for the riskiest space job of all, landing on and leaving from the moon. The particular vehicle designated to take two astronauts to the surface of the moon in mid-1969 is being prepared today by Grumman engineers at Bethpage, Long Island. This is lunar module number five to be attached to Apollo 11. Here is the cabin in which two astronauts will stand. Workmen are making final adjustments on the instrument panels. This is the hatchway down to the lunar surface. The descent to the moon will be slowed by an engine sheathed in plastic for protection and shipment. This is it. Various antennae will aid the lunar landers in rendezvous and docking and in conversation with each other. The radar antenna has been removed for safety during the flight to Cape Kennedy. Perhaps the most critical engine on LEM is this one, the engine that is to lift the upper stage off the moon and get the astronauts back to their command vehicle for return to Earth. It's a smaller version of the same engine that got the Apollo 8 astronauts in and out of lunar orbit and back on course for the Earth. There have been some troubles with the lunar module. In fact, Apollo 8 was originally intended to test the module in Earth orbit, but the module wasn't ready. Now the question is whether it will be ready and safe for the next test and for the moon landing before the end of 1969. In our space center, Mike Wallace talks with a senior Grumman engineer about that and about how LEM works. This strange looking bird, the LEM, Mr. Kelly, how does it work? Well, this is the spacecraft that's used to take men down to the lunar surface. And uh, it's docked to the command module, which uh, the conical shape part of the spacecraft docks to the top of LEM here. And two of the three astronauts enter LEM by crawling in through this tunnel. Once inside, they detach the LEM from the command and service modules, and using this throttleable descent rocket engine, they descend to the lunar surface. That's the only throttleable rocket engine known to man, I gather. Yes, it is. It has to be throttleable in order to land very softly on the surface with the landing gears you see here. Then what? Well, once on the surface, the astronauts uh, will come out through the front hatch here and climb down this ladder to explore the lunar surface. They'll take out some scientific equipment from one of the bays here. Uh, when they've completed their experiments, they re-enter the LEM, and the upper portion of the LEM detaches from the lower portion. Hopefully. And this is called the, oh, definitely. <laughs> and this is called the ascent stage. And we blast off from the lunar surface using this rocket engine here, the ascent rocket engine. We then rendezvous into lunar orbit with the waiting command and service module. We're tracking them all the time with our rendezvous radar. You can see the antenna from that here. Now, there's no backup system on this ascent uh, module, is there? No, it has to work in order to get the men safely home. When they turn the ignition, if nothing happens, then there's just no way for anybody, any place to help them. That's correct. That's why we've made it as simple and reliable as we possibly can. Is that why you are overdue with the lamb? I gather that it's somewhat behind schedule, and there's been some skepticism as to whether you were going to make it in time for Apollo. Well, you didn't make it for Apollo 8, which was supposed to be a a LEM mission? Well, we were very close on Apollo 8. We were having some uh, uh, relatively minor troubles with electromagnetic interference on our spacecraft at the Cape at the time that the missions were being reviewed. Now, it, it also happened that NASA was quite interested in performing the type mission that we just saw on Apollo 8 because they could have, uh, without LEM being there, they could take additional fuel reserves for the lunar orbit. So that's why they went that way. Apollo 9, the next one, the LEM goes along, but this is just Earth orbit. What happens with LEM? LEM will rehearse uh, in Earth orbit the, uh, all the steps except actual landing for the lunar mission. We will fire both of our rocket engines. Uh, we will uh, separate the, the ascent from the descent stages and go through the entire uh, mission. We will even uh, practice an emergency procedure, which is uh, walking in space from the forward hatch of LEM into the side hatch of the command module. Then Apollo 10, 
You're going all the way to the moon, and Lem is going to descend, I understand, to within 50,000 feet of the moon's surface. Yes, Apollo 10 will at least go out into the vicinity of the moon. Is it possible that Apollo 10 will actually land on the moon? It's possible, but I'd say not likely. We think we'll probably want the two full manned missions before we actually go for the landing. Mr. Kelly, is the Lem ready? Yes, sir. And you'd go along? Right, right today. <laughs> The next giant step, then, to put a man on the moon. The flight of Apollo 8 has inspired the poet and many men. In a moment, we'll hear some great poetic reflections on its meaning. Clean air. Clean water. They're worth fighting for. At Western Electric Plants, all across the country, we've been fighting for cleaner air and water for years. Fighting pollution doesn't make the telephone equipment Western Electric builds for the Bell Telephone Companies any better but we breathe a little easier, knowing you do. On Christmas morning, when the three astronauts were soaring around the moon, the New York Times carried on page one an article by Archibald McLeish, elder statesman of American poetry. It seemed to us to say just about all there was to be said about the flight of Apollo 8. So we ask him to read it into our cameras. Herewith, riders on the earth together, brothers in the eternal cold. Men's conception of themselves and of each other has always depended on their notion of the earth. When the earth was the world, all the world there was, and the stars were lights in Dante's heaven, and the ground beneath men's feet roofed hell, and they saw themselves as creatures at the center of the universe, the sole particular concern of God. And from that high place they ruled and killed and conquered as they pleased. And when centuries later the earth was no longer the world but a small wet spinning planet in the solar system of a minor star off of the edge of an inconsiderable galaxy in the immeasurable distances of space, when Dante's heaven had disappeared and there was no hell, no hell at least beneath the feet, and men began to see themselves not as God-directed actors at the center of a noble drama, but as helpless victims of a senseless farce where all the rest were helpless victims also, and millions could be killed in worldwide wars or in blasted cities or in concentration camps without a thought or reason, but the reason, if we call it one, of force. Now, in the last few hours, the notion may have changed again. For the first time in all of time, men have seen the earth, seen it not as continents or oceans from the little distance of a hundred miles or two or three, but seen it from the depths of space, seen it whole and round and beautiful and small as even Dante, that first imagination of Christendom, had never dreamed of seeing it, as the 20th century philosophers of absurdity and despair were incapable of guessing that it might be seen. And seeing it so, one question came to the minds of those who looked at it. Is it inhabited, they said, and laughed, and then they did not laugh. What came to their minds a hundred thousand miles and more into space, halfway to the moon, they put it, what came to their minds was the life on that little lonely floating planet, that tiny raft in the enormous empty night. Is it inhabited? The medieval notion of the earth put man at the center of everything. The nuclear notion of the earth put him nowhere beyond the range of reason even, lost in absurdity and war. This latest notion may have other consequences. 
formed as it was in the minds of heroic voyagers who were also men, it may remake our image of mankind. No longer that preposterous figure at the center. No longer that degraded and degrading victim off at the margins of reality and blind with blood. Man may at last become himself. To see the earth as it truly is, small and blue and beautiful in that eternal silence where it floats, is to see ourselves as together, brothers on that bright loveliness in the eternal cold. Brothers who know now they are truly brothers. We began this broadcast with words from Genesis. In those same verses were written, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Today was the sixth day of the flight of Apollo 8. This is Walter Cronkite. Good night. Who in the world would treat a telephone this way? Western Electric. Western Electric builds rugged phones and tests some of them beyond endurance. Chances are, the phone your Bell Telephone Company installs will never need repair. You can take your Bell phone for granted, because we don't at Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell system. This CBS News special report, Man at the Moon. The flight of Apollo 8 was brought to you by Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell system, the people who provide telephones and equipment that connects them.